Good morning, everyone. Um, we are very happy to be here today at the uh, UMDF Power Search 2020. And I am going to start off by uh, giving you a summary of the new tables for mitochondrial disease toxi drug toxicity. This is a paper that was published in uh, 2019, and it updates the current recommendation for uh, drugs um, in patients with primary mitochondrial disease. This was uh, a list that was uh, much overdue. Um, it's a list of drugs uh, that should be avoided when patients know that they have a primary mitochondrial disease or a genetically inherited mitochondrial disorder. Um, patients who may have a primary mitochondrial disease or are suspected of having a secondary mitochondrial dysfunction might also use this table and this paper as a reference. So why did the list of drug to be avoided needed updating? If you look online, there are several tables that have a long list of medications that patients and families, and as, as well as doctors, have used over the years to try to tailor their prescriptions for patients with mitochondrial diseases. Over the years, we have noticed that a lot of these um, inclusions within these tables were based on very few scientific data. And our personal experiences as mitochondrial disease doctors show that many of these drugs that are listed as being toxic were actually safe as we uh, use them regularly in our patient. So in order to put a little bit of order into all of these tables floating out there on the internet, we wanted to come up with a robust evidence-based new table um, that was more up-to-date with more updated scientific information. And we felt that this was very important to put out there as an international effort um, that is reviewed by several mitochondrial disease experts to help guide the treatment and management of our patients. So how did this process go? Um, so this work has been fully funded by advocacy groups for mitochondrial disorders. They were not uh, financed in any way, form or shape by industry or pharmaceutical companies. This was really uh, responding to patient interest and um, request to update this table of uh, toxic drug for primary mitochondrial disease. So um, IMP, which is the International Mitochondrial Patient Advocacy Group, has put together a group of mitochondrial disease expert uh, from several countries in Europe, the United States, and we uh, met um, virtually initially, and we made a list of all the drugs uh, that we found on the prior tables. And then we divided the list of these drugs amongst ourselves. Uh, there were about 16 uh, physicians, pharmacists, uh, basic scientists, and pharmaco uh, pharmacologists that uh, were part of this group. So exper different expertise from different subgroups. Um, the physicians were neurologists, pediatric neurologists, and genetic and metabolic experts who were well-versed in mitochondrial disease and so mitochondrial disease patients primarily in their practices. And so the way this worked is that we had facilitators of the group and then we had the panelists which were the experts. And um, the uh, panelists were invited and once they accepted the invitation they were given a list of the drugs selected which initially included 32 and they were asked to add any medication that they deemed important to review at the end there were about 46 medication and this is list is not exhaustive but with the means and the time allotted to us that was the maximum drug number that we could review and then we were all assigned a number of drugs to review and by that, I mean, we did a very comprehensive literature search about all what has been published about that drug or uh, family of drug or molecule. And then we reviewed all of that information. We distilled it into summaries. We were very careful to look at whether any experiments were done in the lab, meaning on cells, whether experiments were done on animals, whether there were any clinical trial in patients, and if there were, whether those patients were in large number, small number, and whether they had a primary mitochondrial disease that was genetically confirmed, or whether they were suspected of having mitochondrial disease or had a secondary mitochondrial problem. 
And then we had to write our impressions about the drug or the compound, and we distributed those with questions to the, all the panelists, and we asked them to review and say whether they thought this drug was toxic or not. And then all of those answers were compiled, and at the end, we all met face-to-face -face in Amsterdam uh, for two days. Um, we worked from 7 a.m. until late in the evening and we reviewed all of these drugs one by one, all the evidence that was found, and then we uh, reviewed all the information. We voted again as to whether we had enough evidence to call a drug mitochondrial toxic or not, and at the end we came up with a few tables that I will be sharing with you. So the conclusion of the workshop um, was that after a thorough review of the evidence, we concluded that most drugs on previous lists could be used safely in people affected by primary mitochondrial disease. And this is the first table that you will find on the, um, on the uh, paper that was published. The list of drugs studied and considered safe to use. And if you see here on the left hand of the table, there are the categories of these drugs and the family of the drug like an ACE inhibitor or analgesic, it's pain medication, antipyretic, uh, fever medication, anesthetic. And then on the right side, you see the generic name of uh, this group of medication. For example, analgesic, acetaminophen, or paracetamol, salicylate. And then if you are interested in one drug, you can either look it up by its name or by its uh, category of drug. So most of these drugs listed here are drugs that we have reviewed and that we have deemed to be safe. The table number two within the paper is an important table because it points your attention to drugs that, um, that had special um, recommendation. So um, valproic acid was a drug that we deemed to be um, toxic in certain situations. So if you were a patient who have a polymerase gamma or POLG mutation that you should use this with, or you should not absolutely be given this drug because we know that um, it can cause liver toxicity. Aminoglycosides, which are antibiotic, um, should be given with uh, caution because in certain cases where patients carry a certain type of mitochondrial DNA mutation, these antibiotics can induce sudden hearing loss. So before you are prescribed this medication, you should talk to your doctor about this possibility. And then in general, in patients with uh, mitochondrial disease that causes muscle problems, um, you should talk to your doctor, surgeon, and anesthesiologist if you were to have a procedure requiring anesthetics because neuromuscular blocking agent can um, need to be used under strict monitoring and supervision. Not that they are prohibited, but they have to be used with extra caution. And then in specific situation, uh, we deemed that it was important to know that in general, when you have a primary mitochondrial disease, you are more susceptible to reaction under stressful condition. And as such, when, if you're having general anesthesia, um, not because the anesthetics are toxic to you, but because overall the stress of the surgery and the anesthesia on your body can cause decompensation, that the doctors needed to be mindful that you needed extra time to recover from the anesthesia, extra hydration. And so all of these recommendations are in this table that you can share with your doctor. We also have provision as to the duration of treatment. For example, we know that certain drugs might not be toxic if they are taken for a few days, but if you are on them uh, on a, for a long period of time, such as maybe antibiotic or steroids, if you are to take them, for example, for three months or six months because you have asthma or you have another autoimmune disease, then um, the, their toxicity might be different, not because of the length of therapy as opposed to the drug being toxic itself. If you have kidney injury, then your kidneys are not clearing the drug as efficiently as someone who has a normal kidney. So the dose that you might should be on might need to be adjusted by your doctor because of your kidney problems. And if you have like high lactic acid, uh, you might also want to stay away from some drugs that can further increase your lactic acid level. All of these are provisions that are unique to patients and that need to be discussed on a case-by-case -case basis by your doctor. So the important principles from this um, review, extensive review of literature, um, is that it's important to remember that side effects 
can occur with any medicine in any patient. Um, any one of us who takes medication can be subject to these side effects. Having a mitochondrial disorder does not seem to predispose you to more, develop more side effects from these medications. But under certain circumstances, some extra precaution need to be taken. And that medication um, can affect any, uh, and that you can affect anyone taking a medicine and may not be related to your mitochondrial disease, meaning that um, you might be sensitive to certain medication um, independently from your mitochondrial disease. Like we are all born with different genetic predisposition and we all react to environmental exposures and different things differently. The same can happen when you take a medication. So you may develop some side effect from certain medication um, and it may not be directly related to your underlying mitochondrial disease, but to other genetic factors that you hold. Uh, and it's always very essential that before you take any medication prescribed by your doctor or over the counter or on the internet to always talk to your doctor about the possible side effect of these medication. I think it's also important to know the difference between what medication can cause. So this paper was really focused on mitochondrial toxicity, meaning that we wanted to really know if your mitochondrial disease puts you at higher risk to developing any side effect or adverse reaction from being on a certain drug. And the answer for the most was no. Your mitochondrial disease is not predisposing you to have more side effects for, from certain medication, except under those circumstances listed in table two. Having said that, side effects from medication can happen regardless of your mitochondrial disease. And these are some aspects that I wanted to make clear. So medication can cause side effects. And what side effects are, are secondary unwanted effects that occur due to the drug therapy. Meaning that if you take a drug, for example, and you develop headache or vomiting or nausea, that's a side effect from the medication. And that is unrelated or can be unrelated to your mitochondrial disease or any mitochondrial toxicity. This is different from an adverse reaction, which is an unintended pharmacological effect that occur when a medication is administered correctly. So if you take a drug, for example, to thin your blood, uh, because you have a, uh, a you have um, some issue um, with your heart, for example, this is a, if you have an arrhythmia of your heart, you need to have uh, your blood thin so you don't develop clot and while taking that blood thinning medication, you develop a clot, that's an adverse reaction that wasn't intended. And so that's considered to be an adverse reaction, not a side effect. So you're not developing a new symptom or your symptoms are not being um, in, um, exacerbated because you're on the drug, you're just developing an unintended consequence of being on the drug. These two are also different from an allergic reaction, which is a reaction by your immune system to something that is usually not harmful to your body. So your immune, react, your immune system reacts to the drug as being a foreign body, and that immune system reaction causes a lot of acute symptoms such as shortness of breath, fever, sweating, inability to breathe, um, and, um, and can cause shock and anaphylaxis. These are the most serious side effects of taking medication. And these usually happen between 5 to 10% um, of patients who develop side effect. So all of these can happen in anybody, regardless of whether they have a mitochondrial disease or not. And so when you're looking at the list of medication, you might not see medication you are on, on you, or you might feel that you have taken medication and you've developed problem from, from that medication and you wonder why it's not listed as being mitotoxic. It's because we couldn't find any evidence that that medication is causing a direct mitochondrial toxicity, but that medication might be causing a side effect, an adverse reaction, or an allergic reaction that is independent from your mitochondrial disease. Um, so we are hoping that this new updated version could replace all the previous versions that you might find out there on the internet. And uh, we would urge you to have a copy of it. You can find these lists on um, all the advocacy group websites. You can also Google it and it will come up free. Um, a list of medicine considered to be safe for mitochondrial disease. And um, I would, um, recommend that you consult with your doctor and you provide all of your doctors with a copy of this list to consult before they prescribe anything to you.
I would like to thank everyone who was involved in the preparation and the writing of this paper, including IMP, the International Mito Patient, the advocacy group, Global Mitochondrial Disease Awareness um, Advocacy Group that has uh, funded this uh, project. Also, Dr. DeVries and Dr. Mancuso, who have been the lead on this project, putting together the um, authors and uh, hosting and uh, doing the bulk of the work, as well as all my other other co-authors uh, who have contributed to all of this body of work. And with that, I will end and um, I uh, will ask Dr. S Dr. Brick and Dr. Goldstein to join me into um, more discussions. Okay. Thank you, um, Dr. Kerr. I think that was a wonderful overview and um, we understand that that was quite an endeavor to go through all of the medications. Um, I heard about this effort and I was very excited to see the results because um, as a doctor who takes care of children and adults with mitochondrial disease, pretty much every clinic visit we go over what medications could be harmful and what any individual patient needs to watch out for. Um, and the list of medications that were considered to be harmful that were on the internet um, for years before this project, I've actually seen um, do some harm to some of my patients. So I'm very happy to see this updated version. Um, I've had patients that um, were avoiding antibiotics in their children because they heard that antibiotics were harmful to mitochondria. And of course, you know, everything needs to be weighed in terms of risks and benefits, but I've had patients that um, delayed that got delayed antibiotics and ended up in the ICU for pneumonia because the family was actually quite scared about giving their child an antibiotic. And um, we just need to, I think, re-educate our population. And of course, we still want everyone being vigilant and making sure that um, they are um, watching for any potential side effects. But I, I think this really opens up um, a whole new area for our patients that could benefit from drugs that they previously were avoiding. Um, another few examples um, that come, um, you know, to my attention in, in daily life um, are I have a number of patients with MILAS who have diabetes and their endocrinologists have been concerned about using metformin. I saw metformin is on the list of medicines that we now consider safe. We know metformin for diabetes can raise the lactic acid, um, but I think it's important to know what any patient's baseline is because if an endocrinologist just draws a lactate and sees that it's five, they may stop the metformin and that actually might be the patient's baseline and is not harmful. Um, I have had a number of patients where they stopped the metformin and their diabetes became um, really out of control and they were suffering uh, the effects of diabetes. And so back on metformin, they have tighter control. Um, I wanted to also mention a few other examples um, there is a special category for anesthesia in that paper, and I think it was very good to review that, especially the neuromuscular blockade. Um, I still see patients that come in that um, want us to use malignant hyperthermia precautions, and I think that that has kind of been a myth for a very long time. Um, and also uh, the strict uh, use of propofol um, to avoid propofol, and we've all seen Patients with mitochondrial disease can do quite well with propofol, especially if it's a short case. Um, not patients with fatty acid oxidation disorders, and certainly if someone's had propofol or any combination before and has had complications, that needs to be reviewed with an anesthesiologist prior to the next surgery or sedation. Um, but we've all seen propofol used safely in our patient population, and it, and it can be a very good anesthetic for short cases, so I'm glad to see that that's no longer kind of on the blacklist. Um, the final comment I wanna make, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Preek, is um, the use of lac lactated ringers. And so this, uh, I think, is a special consideration, and you did mention the use of IV fluids and the fact that it should be containing glucose, and I agree with that. I think that some of our patients have lactic acidosis, and if they get lactated ringers as part of their fluid, I don't think any harm comes to them. However, I do think that there are some patients that really can't use lactate as a source of fuel. And so in that case, we may need to um, avoid lactated ringers and ask for another fluid. However, in the world of trauma and sepsis and hypotension and shock, 
sometimes lactated ringers is actually the preferred fluid for resuscitation. And in that case, I tell my patients, please let them use lactated ringers if they feel that this is the most appropriate fluid at that time. So I want to uh, emphasize again what you've already said, that most of the drugs that we've had on this blacklist have now been list lifted. Um, at and it still needs to be an individual decision between the patient and their treating physician. Thank you. No, I, I will second that. Um, I would agree completely that that list that we had created too much fear and too much worry amongst our patients. Most of us who practice mitochondrial medicine knew that most of the things on those lists could be used, um, but we always had to be cautious with certain medications, but it didn't mean that we couldn't use them. Um, something as common as acetaminophen or Tylenol, which most of our families and patients tolerate completely well. Um, though again, when, because we individualize these medications, if you have underlying liver disease and are, are in the middle of something where you might have liver failure, nobody should be using Tylenol at that time, whether you have a mitochondrial disease or not. So it, it is really nice that this group of individuals was able to streamline the list, clean it up. And I, I do fear that those old lists uh, with those old, all that big long list of medications is unfortunately is not going to uh, go away anytime soon. Uh, but we would very much like to make sure that most of our families are using updated lists. Um, and then it really does come down to having your team individualize your care. I think some mitochondrial patients have liver disease, most don't. Some mitochondrial patients have kidney disease, most don't. Some may have heart failure, uh, some may not. And in those situations, the list of medications that get used may need to be adjusted. So even things that are on the quote unquote safe list may need to get modified, used at a different dose or used in a different way. And so for all these reasons, yes, in general, our list has gotten much shorter, uh, but just, we, we need to make sure that the care we provide you is individualized to you and um, not, not just a blanket statement uh, where we apply the same thing to everybody. I also very much appreciate Dr. Kara going over the issue of medication side effect and sensitivity. Um, every person processes drugs differently. And we now know that um, there are some people who have much more sensitivity to medication. This is not a mitochondrial disease issue, primary or secondary. This is a person issue. And, and we're not smart enough yet to understand the genetics for it. We don't have great testing to see why people are medication sensitive, but we know that there are. There are some people who take one dose of Tylenol and then they're sleeping for three days. Um, I, I have a patient like that. Um, you know, we have some people who take the tiniest dose, a pediatric dose of medication, they're adult sized and then they end up having huge changes in their blood pressure. And so in those situations, you just need to, again, note that you're medication sensitive and be cautious about the medicine you use and the dosing that you use at that time when you start something new, but it doesn't mean that it's because of your mitochondrial disease or dysfunction. And, and then it should not be an automatic, I avoid this whole category or whole family of medication. Um, I think those are the main points I wanted to make. Yes, thank you both. Um, exactly. I think the message that we want to put across is that everyone is different and you really need to talk to your doctors before you make any decisions. Um, we did receive some questions um, before, the, um, the, b before the presentation, so we wanted to address them. Um, there were many personal questions that we won't address individually, but there were certain themes that emerged from all the questions. One of them is the use of supplements in mitochondrial disease. Dr. Puri, can you tell us a little bit about um, how you proceed and what you, how you think about supplements for primary mitochondrial disorders? Sure. So, you know, and, and what I usually tell my families is that unfortunately supplements are the one place where you're going to get so much variability depending on which mito expert you talk to. And, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that we don't have great science yet backing up most of uh, what we do with vitamins and supplements. You know, um, as part of the Mitochondrial Medicine Society, as part of the National Mitochondrial Care Network, we're very much trying to standardize and unify the care we offer families. So we're hoping that if you go to the center at 
Philadelphia and Boston and Cleveland or on the West Coast that you're going to get very similar care for most things. Uh, but we know that vitamins and supplements are one place where you're going to see a lot of variability that there are still personal beliefs that guide vitamin supplementation. There are still um, a lot of personal experience that clinicians may have had where they've seen a wonderful response or a poor response that changes the kinds of recommendations they make. Um, that being said, um, there are some vitamins and supplements that have received a bit more study. And um, we're going to post a link up on here. The, National Institute of Health did a wonderful review of uh, the vitamins and supplements used for mitochondrial disease. And um, it's available freely online. So we're going to make that link available to all of you. Um, and then there is also a website called examine.com, um, which is a independent website that is run by PhD scientists that reviews the evidence base for any and all vitamins and supplements, not just mitochondrial disease supplements. And so if you ever come across something and wanna know, can it help mitochondrial function or not? What is the evidence base for it? What other problems might it create? What is the dosing I should use? Examine.com does walk through um, some of these things. And, and most of the information is available for free. Um, so I usually recommend these two resources to all my families and patients. As far as supplements go, you will pretty consistently hear most mitochondrial docs try a few things. Um, and, and that's just based on historically, we may have seen benefits and there may be a little bit more science backing up some of these vitamins and supplements, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that these vitamins and supplements are the right vitamin for you. It's just that it's something that you're going to hear we would like for you to try to see if it causes any benefits. Um, those include things like coenzyme Q10, creatine, alpha lipoic acid, and some of the B vitamins, the B complexes. Uh, most of these things have very potent antioxidant effects. They also um, can help maybe make your mitochondria work a little bit better, but it is very true that they work to varying degrees in various patients. Some people have zero response to any of these. Some people do have some improvement in some of their symptoms like fatigue. Um, and then there are a small percentage of patients that see a very night and day difference and, and really get a benefit from these medications. In general, because they're relatively low cost, because they have relatively few side effects, um, and because if you try them for three to six months and you see a benefit, um, it's often worth it for most of us to at least recommend that you give some of these medications a fair shake and trial. But um, again, you'll get some differences here, but. Um, my recommendation usually is if you're not seeing dramatic benefits um, after three to six months, considering stopping it or maybe trying something different. Very good. Thank you. Um, obviously, because we're all living in the COVID pandemic era, we've had uh, a few questions regarding um, COVID-related therapies. Um, one of the questions was, um, whether any of the drugs uh, or treatments in trial for COVID-19 was toxic to the mitochondria. Um, it's unclear at this time because I don't think that anyone is specifically looking for mitochondrial toxicity in the setting of these drugs, um, but we are waiting to see whether any of them are actually efficacious um, against COVID-19 before we start thinking more specifically about our subpopulation of patient. But again, in an emergent situation in the acute setting when life is at risk. Um, it doesn't matter if a drug is really mitotoxic or not, because if you had to choose between life or, or worsening of your mitochondrial disease symptom, you're always, the doctors will always choose life. And so you will be, or you should allow to be given to you or to your family members, a drug that is life-saving. And then we would worry about your mitochondrial disease symptom getting worse later. Um, but there were specific questions regarding hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. And I was wondering, Dr. Goldstein, um, whether you could comment a little bit about the, these two drugs in general and their risk uh, in mitochondrial disease patients. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so the azithromycin is a common antibiotic and many people have been on it for, you know, what's called walking pneumonia, community acquired pneumonia, otherwise known as a ZPAC. Um, and again, um, in the older sources, um, erythromycin or azithromycin were on uh, the list of medicines to potentially avoid. However, 
Um, we have seen many patients that have needed to be on a ZPAC for common infections and they do quite well. Um, and I've had patients that are on chronic use of medicines such as zithromycin or um, its cousin erythromycin for GI motility issues and they tolerate it well. So again, I think there's, there's no problem um, in using zithromycin appropriately. Um, I would also just put in a little plug here for um, antibiotic overuse. Um, there are many patients that call their doctors and they want a Z-Pack because they have what they think is bronchitis or something like that. And it may just be a viral infection and not true bacterial infection. And so I think we need to continue to be vigilant about antibiotic overuse. Um, but in terms of using it for COVID-19, if the evidence shows that zithromycin is effective um, in terms of uh, part of the therapy, then I would not hold back using zithromycin in that situation. I think the hydroxychloroquine question is a little bit more um, complicated um, because um, you know we've all heard and we've all been on this roller coaster together about whether it's effective therapy or not and whether it should be used prophylactically or as part of the treatment. And I don't think we have enough evidence yet to see if hydroxychloroquine is effective therapy. Um, I don't know if each hospital has standardization of care yet for COVID-19. So I would say that if somebody is infected and needs to be in the hospital and is suffering from the respiratory symptoms or you know, uh, impending respiratory failure or other symptoms, that whatever the hospital protocol is at that time um, should be given. And um, as you had already said, Dr. Karen, not to worry about the mitochondrial function at that time, because um, you know, if you're in a hospital with respiratory symptoms and facing intubation, um, the risk and the benefit is, is far in favor of life-saving therapy. Um, there are a number of other medicines right now that are in trial for COVID-19. And again, I believe that each hospital, depending on how many patients they've already seen, is, is using their own protocol. And we hope that um, the CDC and other guidance um, physician bodies have more evidence for us um, in the near future. And we look forward to those publications. Yes, uh, great, thank you, Dr. Goldstein. Um, I think we were also, um, when we reviewed the questions that were submitted, we had, um, uh, we wanted to make a comment about um, a lot of patients asking about um, symptoms or condition that they attributed to a primary mitochondrial disease. We understand that a lot of people are undergoing diagnostic odysseys and may have a lot of symptoms and th they don't have a definitive diagnosis of mitochondrial disease at this stage. We wanted to be careful about the labels that we use. Um, there were some uh, a question specifically asking about uh, my mitochondrial disease is causing this hyperinflammatory uh, reaction and how do I treat that? Um, we just wanted to, to, to say that um, in our knowledge, we don't see hyperinflammatory reaction as being part of primary mitochondrial disease. And so we wanted to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about what we consider a primary mitochondrial disease that is genetically inherited with a gene that is identified um, and where a patient has what we call a proven mitochondrial disease from all those other patients who are truly suffering from very disabling symptoms and may have been told that they have a mitochondrial disease or have some biochemical evidence of a mitochondrial dysfunction that is uh, probably secondary to some other process. And we understand that these patients need to be further investigated and need to have, uh, deserve to have a, a final diagnosis. Um, yet for our academic purposes and for the purpose of uh, furthering the understanding of the primary mitochondrial disease, we tried um, very hard over the last years to make a, a little bit of a distinction uh, between those patients that have a confirmed diagnosis and those who are still in search for a primary for a primary diagnosis. And I think that um, we need to address the elephant in the room and talk a little bit about the paper that was published a few years ago, uh, where we clearly um, distinguish the, the labels. And I think that um, the paper has been 
misunderstood or um, um, not misrepresented, but I think that a lot of people um, uh, were frustrated because we were using terms like we, uh, possible mitochondrial disease is very vague and shouldn't be used. So I was wondering, um, Dr. Goldstein and Dr. Parikh, how you handle this distinction between primary and secondary mitochondrial dysfunction and how you address this when you you're talking to your patients. Sure. So, um, no, thank you for that, um, Dr. Kara. I, I think I would agree that our purpose for writing that paper was very much so that we could make sure that we were labeling our patients appropriately so that we could provide the best care possible. What we have seen over the last decade as our diagnostic testing abilities improved, as our genetics knowledge improved, is that there were so many patients that were being labeled as having a mitochondrial issue um, that we found many other different types of genetic diseases. And why that was so important is because for those patients, the prognosis was completely different, that the plan of care that we made for them once the diagnosis was known was completely different. The type of monitoring we did for those patients was completely different. And what we learned is that maybe if we hadn't labeled those patients as having quote unquote possible mitochondrial disease or dysfunction, we might have reached that answer or diagnosis sooner or people, the medical teams may have been more open-minded in wanting to look for another cause for those problems and not necessarily having waited uh, for as long as they did. And, and uh, you know, it, it's vastly important Mitochondrial diseases are unfortunately a horrible group of genetic diseases to have. Um, you know, we wouldn't wish them on, on anyone. And um, we know that as families and patients, it is a very frustrating and difficult thing to be told that your clinicians, your doctors, your medical team don't know exactly what is going on with you. But as uncomfortable as that might be, we would rather your teams use that label that we don't know what's going on. You might have some mitochondrial dysfunction, but we don't have a diagnosis for you yet because that's accurate. And it allows for your entire medical team to make sure that they keep an open mind when they're evaluating you. Don't put certain restrictions on your medical care that, that don't need to apply, um, especially for example, when we had that big long medication list and some of our families and patients weren't getting antibiotics or certain medications they should have been getting because um, a clinician was afraid to use those medicines. Um, and, and make sure that as our knowledge and testing abilities improve, that we keep pushing the ball forward, that we keep testing you and looking for problems. Um, it, it is not to dismiss your symptoms. It is not to uh, dismiss your mitochondrial dysfunction. It really is to make sure that we are on the right path and that we're writing the right plan of care for you. Um, so that, that was the purpose of that paper, and it was written more directed at clinicians and medical uh, teams to say, hey, just because you don't know what's going on and you've seen a little bit of mitochondrial dysfunction, don't, don't stop there. Don't just hang this patient under uh, the umbrella of, oh, it's possible mitochondrial disease and say you're done because your job is not done. You, you still need to keep looking. You still need to be thoughtful and mindful and you need to be able to say, hey, you know what? We're not that smart. We're not as smart as we want to be. Our knowledge is still evolving and growing and we're only able to diagnose a subset of our patients. And, and that's just the state of medicine right now. And don't be afraid to say that to your families and patients and let them know that we're still going to take care of you. We're still here for you, but I don't want to just because it comforts me or it comforts you just give you a, a false diagnosis or, or a diagnosis that's an imperfect fit. Um, so that was the message we were trying to convey, uh, though I don't know if it completely came across, mostly because this was written for other uh, medical personnel and clinicians and scientists and, and not directly addressing families and patients when we wrote this paper. Thank you, Dr. Sumit. That was excellent. Dr. Goldstein, anything to add? Sure. Um, I think that um, I, I echo everything that's been said already. Um, and a couple other things I keep in mind are that um, 
you know, a lot of our patients um, had muscle biopsies or skin biopsies or biochemistry that was done 10 years ago or more. And they may be carrying this diagnosis of mitochondrial dysfunction or a complex one deficiency or, you know, complex deficiency around with them, but it's never had genetic confirmation. And we've all seen the growing list of other diseases that can have secondary mitochondrial dysfunction associated with them. Um, personally, at, in Philadelphia, I work very closely with the group of epilepsy doctors, and we've seen patients with, for, for example, STX BP1 related epilepsy have secondary mito dysfunction. Um, and we've tried to treat it with mito cocktail, and we don't see any improvements. Um, but um, we've also historically seen this in patients with Rett syndrome and Angelman syndrome and Down syndrome. So there are a number of neurological conditions that can give you an abnormal muscle biopsy when you look at the mitochondrial function. I think the same is true in the world of adult neurodegenerative disease. Um, there are papers that show adults with Parkinson's or Huntington's or Alzheimer's or ALS um, can have secondary mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, in terms of clinical trials, we know where we've gone so far with primary mitochondrial disease that in order to be included in a clinical trial, the genetic etiology needs to be known, uh, proven, and not only that, but agreed upon by an adjudication committee. And that's really so that we can make sure we are including patients that have definite genetic mitochondrial disease so we can hopefully prove one of these therapies works and have an FDA approved cure. Um, I have also had patients that come in with the muscle biopsy and then we do updated genetic testing and we find another answer in another category that opens up for other therapy. Um, recently I had a woman who had come in who had abnormal muscle biopsy and for years had uh, urine organic acids that showed glutaric aciduria type 2 pattern and she, as an adult, was recently diagnosed with a congenital disorder of glycosylation and is now getting specific therapy for that. So, you know, I, again, I think it's very important um, to realize why the, we felt the paper was needed. We, um, I thought, saw a growing cohort of adults, especially, that kind of were carrying this label of mito, but not having a definite diagnosis. And by sticking a label on somebody, it kind of stops the diagnostic workup from anybody else. So I think it's very helpful for our patients to remove the label and let the diagnostic workup continue and hopefully get to something more definitive that can offer better treatment and better symptom management. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I think we're done with the submitted question and uh, we should turn it over to the live questions. So we are now back live, ready to take your questions in the chat feature. So we invite you now to uh, submit your questions so that the doctors now may answer them. And Dr. Kara, I want to begin with you. Uh, this was quite a project, and I really am interested in knowing um, how long did it really take to, to go through all of this? And, and really, why did you all decide to tackle this? Uh, was it out of patient concern because some of these medications just weren't making sense to be on that list? Yes, thank you, Cliff. Uh, <clears throat> well, it took um, months and months, almost a year, uh, from the time the committee or the group was put together to the time where we were all agreed on the findings that uh, we researched and we came up with, and it took many more months to get that, that paper published. Um, and we really try to be very diligent in terms of looking at every publication out there to make sure that we were not missing anything. I think this is also the first time where we really wanted to put forth all the information available, whether in an animal model, whether in a cell, in a petri dish with cells, or in an animal model, or um, in clinical trial that used humans, and more specifically, if there were any trial that used mitochondrial disease patient, because it's very different to look at these drugs in a petri dish versus an animal versus human that don't have mitochondrial disease. Um, as to why this was undertaking, well, this was solicited by the IMP, the International Mitochondrial 
participation group because they have been having a lot of uh, comments and feedback from the patient um, to update this list. Um, as you know, there have been many tables out there over the years um, that have accumulated and sometimes um, some of the information within these table um, can be uh, con contradictory. So some of the patient wanted an updated version and consolidation of all of these tables out there. Um, we were also seeing um, as physicians and clinician, a lot of concerns from our colleagues in hospitals where in the acute setting, for example, uh, we needed to use a medication that the patient or a family might um, have um, objected to. And so it really came from both ends. The patients requested it and the clinicians were concerned about it. Dr. Goldstein, I know you mentioned in, in your talk um, about the antibiotics. Was there anything else that, that surprised you that, that was added to the list that, of, of, of medications that could be used? Uh, no, again, I was very happy to see that the group had looked at all the antibiotics and um, gave careful consideration to them, but really stressed uh, that overall antibiotics seem to be safe. You know, there is one caveat. Um, if you have a specific mitochondrial mutation, um, you might be more prone to aminoglycoside-related deafness. Aminoglycosides are not used that commonly. Um, and, you know, there's a question about whether someone should be tested for that mutation prior to being given aminoglycosides. But aside from that, uh, we, um, I think, now have more of an understanding that it's okay for our patients to take antibiotics when they're needed. And just to reemphasize, I've had patients that have had serious bacterial infections that required antibiotics, and my patients were concerned and worried about taking them. Uh, and having said all that, again, everything that we're talking about is really general and nothing can replace um, the patient's individual experience. Anyone can have side effects to medications or sensitivities to medications. And so we're not saying that, you know, antibiotics are fine for everybody. Somebody could be allergic and have a rash um, to an antibiotic. So this still needs to be a decision that's made one-on-one -on -one with the treating physician. Dr. Parikh, I know that you worked uh, in years past on, on an ER protocol letter. Um, will that change as a result of, of this new work? Well, of course. I think most individual institutions and hospitals usually update those letters periodically. And so we, we've updated ours. Um, you know, there are certain medications that can cause lactic acidosis that we leave on that list. But otherwise, yeah, no, that medicine list is, is a lot shorter than it used to be. Yeah, and Cliff, can I, if I might add, sure. um, through the Mitochondrial Care Network, we are really working on standardizing these letters, for, whether for the ER or for an acute protocol, and so that every time any patient goes to any of the sites, they will receive the same letter holding the same information and the same guidelines. And that, that will be coming within a year, would, would you think? Hopefully, yes. Okay. Um, Dr. Kara, can we talk about, about supplements? Um, a lot of patient families are asking about those and um, whether or not those are added to the list. Can you, can you give us your, your best thoughts on that? Sure. Um, we, we get questions about supplements all the time, especially in the era of internet and social media. There are, there's so much information out there about supplements. I, I think um, the, the pub, there, there's so much publicity about um, supplements improving mitochondria in general, especially for aging and memory. And so um, naturally our patients with mitochondrial disease are always asking whether what they've heard about on TV or on the internet might be helpful for their mitochondrial disease. Um, although there are publication out there that have looked at certain supplements in animal models, such as mice or rats or other cell models, it's sometimes very hard to extrapolate from that to what is going to happen if we gave this supplement to our mitochondrial disease patients. A few years ago, the Mitochondrial Medicine Society has put forth guidelines as to what supplements um, were, deemed to be were deemed to be helpful. Um, and what we mean by helpful is that we had very scarce 
data from small clinical trials that were specifically done in mitochondrial disease patient, primary mitochondrial disease patient, that have shown that there was some um, modest improvement in muscle strength when patients were on these supplements. And those supplements are coenzyme Q10 in the form of ubiquinol, um, uh, riboflavin or vitamin B2, and alpha lipoic acid, which is an uh, antioxidant. And so these are, for the majority, the ones that we have some information about. Most recently, the, there have been other uh, trials done, especially for vitamin B3, which is another vitamin that is uh, used um, for NAD production, which is a molecule that is very crucial to the cell metabolism and it is used uh, as an electron carrier in, within the mitochondria. Um, there, our colleagues in Helsinki have looked at the intake of this vitamin B3 in a, in a patient population that had a mitochondrial myopathy. Uh, but what they looked at is really whether those patients had lower levels of vitamin B3, and they they did show that they did that those patients did have a lower vitamin B3 level. And when they gave them vitamin B3, their level went up. But we still don't really know what the long-term effect of that is going to be, and whether that is going to translate into really some meaningful improvement in patients' muscle strength or in patients' um, other um, organ uh, involvement. And so, what I tell my patient is, we really have to be careful because publications we can find many of them saying that any supplement is really helpful and other publication that might say that if you give too much of a good thing, it might become toxic and it might be um, not helpful any, um, anymore. Dr. Marnie Falk at CHOP has done, has published recently a lot about an acetylcysteine and vitamin E. And so there is work being done out there to try to come up with um, the answer to this specific question. What kind of supplement should our patients be on? Um, and a lot of us do prescribe um, in the absence of having a cure. We do prescribe and do some small scale N of one trials for each of our patients. But I think right now we have a lack of a good robust information with a clinical trial in our patient population to allow us to say with certainty that certain supplements should be recommended for every patient. Dr. Parik, I want to ask you, we, we have a question coming in about, about genetic testing. And if somebody has mitochondrial dysfunction, they've, they've, they suspect it, and they don't have a genetic test, what is the next step for that, that patient? So if somebody has mitochondrial dysfunction identified and genetic testing remains what we call non-diagnostic, um, it, it's a frustrating place to be for, for any family, any patient. In the world of rare disease, even though our genetic testing abilities have improved vastly, if we're generous, we can say that we find an answer half the time. You know, the number or the yield of testing right now is anywhere from 30 to 50%, which means comfortably half of our patients stay without a genetic diagnosis. And, and whether that be mitochondrial dysfunction or developmental disability or muscle or nerve disease, um, our recommendation usually is, is that you have a group of uh, a team of individuals who are going to care for you and your symptoms, uh, but not box you in um, and make you necessarily kind of force fit you into a puzzle that may not be a good fit. Um, the examples that um, Dr. Goldstein gave um, are just some of hundreds that we found now with genetic testing advancing. So there are many, many, many patients who thought that they had a mitochondrial disease because mitochondrial dysfunction was found in their blood or in their urine, or they had low CoQ10 or carnitine levels, or even their muscle biopsy showed problems. Um, even small little mitochondrial DNA deletions. But then as our testing got smarter, we found something else that had nothing directly to do with mitochondrial disease. And the reason this is so important is because, you know, um, Mitochondrial disease itself is a tough diagnosis to have. We know that it can unfortunately march forward sometimes. We know that it can affect other parts of the body. And um, by putting that diagnosis, putting that label on somebody, we're asking them to carry a lot of weight. And we're asking them to worry about what's coming in the future. And I understand that we have to weigh that with not knowing what's coming when we don't have a firm diagnosis. But um, we want you to have to worry about the right thing. We want you to have to worry about what really applies to you and not necessarily carry the burden of something that may not. Um, and um, this is one of these reasons where 
okay, there's mitochondrial dysfunction, we don't know what it is, we can treat it, we can try to use supplements, we can try other things, we wanna treat your other symptoms, but we don't necessarily need to put all the restrictions and precautions we put on a patient with genetic mitochondrial disease um, on your plate. We don't need to put all that uh, concern of the poor prognosis or what else may come on your plate just yet. And we wanna make sure that you and your team continue to look for new things, either as your symptoms evolve or just as genetic testing gets smarter. And that's a good point. So Dr. Goldstein, if somebody has already had a genetic test and you know we're now several years out, would you recommend a retest if they didn't find anything and they're still having symptoms or would you just base anything on that first test? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Cliff, for that question because I wanted to um, piggyback on what Dr. Preek had just said. So the field of genetics is still evolving. Many of us are using a test called whole exome sequencing to look in non-invasive tissue, um, meaning the blood, or this can be done with a buccal swab, um, to do whole exome sequencing and look at the mitochondrial DNA. And we have in the nuclear uh, genes, in the nuclear DNA, we have about 20,000 genes, but we don't know what all of them do yet. And I think it's very important for people to realize this. If you have a clinical exome and it comes back non-diagnostic, um, realize that the company that's running it is looking specifically at about 8,000, 9,000 genes, the genes that we know. There could be a candidate gene that we don't know about yet that is not gonna show up on the clinical report. And this is where the beauty of doing an exome reanalysis lies because over the course of a year or two, we discover the rate is about 10 new genes a month or about 100 new genes a year. And so I've had patients that have come to me when we do an exome reanalysis a year or two later and we get a diagnosis. This just happened to a patient we have in the hospital this week um, where you know the gene was a candidate gene and now it, there was a new publication saying this gene, um, there's now a cause, there, it's now a known cause of a, a specific disease, a specific condition. So that is still evolving along with other techniques. Um, so I mentioned earlier that I have patients that come to me that have had a muscle biopsy done years ago. Well, the technology's changed. The analogy we like to use is, you know, this is just like playing video games, right? I grew up with Atari. Um, my kids would not know what to do with an Atari. They want PlayStation or, you know, whatever the, new, the newest model is. So the technology has evolved, and that means that our ability to do specific tests, especially in muscle, um, has evolved. And so there are times where we are calling the previous hospital that did the muscle biopsy, and some of them keep these samples in the freezer forever. And so we've been able to get muscle that's 10 years old and send it for new testing. Um, another wrinkle to all of this, of course, is getting the insurance company to reimburse this. And I'm not even going to go into that right now. Um, but we fight very hard to get the testing done. Um, but then there are other things that are evolving. So for example, I mentioned whole exome sequencing. Um, the next new technology that's coming out is whole genome sequencing. So the exome is just ch checking the exons, the coding regions of the DNA. That's about 2% of our DNA. So the genome, the entire DNA with all the instructions to what the DNA should be doing, there can be mutations in that portion of the DNA as well. So some hospitals are now able to send whole genome sequencing clinically. Another new technology that has been available for just a very short time is something called RNA sequencing that can be done in muscle and skin and, and there's evolving technology to do this in blood cells. Um, my hospital at CHOP, um, Dr. Ganetsky is working on many new assays to look at um, different um, levels in the mitochondria. So Dr. Kara was just talking about looking at NAD as a supplement while we're looking at, can we measure NAD um, in the lab? Um, and of course, assays for coenzyme Q10 have been around for quite some time and we're still perfecting those. So the technology continues to move forward and our patients that don't have a specific diagnosis, I don't want anyone giving up. Um, it, we know it's a long, hard road. Um, and I, I, I want people to hang in there and be open-minded to mitochondrial possibilities and the non-mitochondrial possibilities and to keep the diagnosis going so that, at, you know, at some point you have a definite and, and hopefully treatable condition. Okay, doctors, thank you all so very much for taking these questions. And as Power Surge continues, we invite you 
to stay with us for the big pitch, which is coming up next. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you.